Turning to the gospel according to Luke chapter 10, please. Luke's gospel chapter 10. And we're reading from the verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise also a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, certain Samaritan as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbour unto him? that fell among the thieves. And he said, He that showeth mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. And we know that God will bless the reading of his word. The light that's going to shine from the word of God tonight is coming from an old lamp. This well-worn, well-preached, well-run story of the parable of the good smart. And I know tonight that most of you know it inside out, or many of you anyway. A Jewish worshipper was heading down from the temple in Jerusalem down to Jericho, a journey of 15 miles. He was traveling alone, and that that terrain on that road was a dangerous one. It was a rocky, barren road, infested with bandits and robbers. And suddenly, out of the thicket, as he was in a lonely place, these bandits laid upon him, stripping him, wounding him, and leaving him half dead. And those three things are in order, stripping him, wounding him, and leaving him half dead. He was hovering, in other words, between death and life. I don't know whether he heard them or not, but we can in our mind's mind's ear tonight hear the footsteps of the priest coming from the temple. The priest did a month in the temple and they went back to Jericho where a number of thousands, where three or four thousand of them lived in Jericho. And after completing a month in the temple, offering up oblations and sacrifices and going through the commandments and reading the Torah of the Old Testament scripture truth and all the Jewish ritual, he came on his way home. And it says that he came to 
where he was, and he passed by on the other side. In other words, he gave this poor, dying, bleeding, wounded man a wide berth and went on his way. Then came the, the Levite. And the Levite came and he came over to where he was. And he looked at him and he passed on as well on the other side. And then come the good Samaritan on a beast or a donkey or something. And he had compassion on him. He's the only one had compassion on him and he wasn't even a Jew. He was a Gentile hated by the Jews. You see, his own people had no compassion on him. And that's often the way in the church. And some of God's people have no compassion. No compassion for the lost. No compassion for brothers and sisters who get themselves into trouble. And sometimes the world comes in. And sometimes others come in. And they give what the church should be given. And it's so sad. And there's many cases of it. I can tell you uh, tonight. And so this uh, good Samaritan jumped down of the beast, poured in the oil and the wine, and he got him onto the beast and brought him uh, to the inn uh, where he left him and paid the host to look after him. Now before we look at these three types of people that came across this man, and I'm leaving one of them out, I'm leaving the priest out, but there were three other types of people who came in contact with this man. Now, I don't know whether he should have been on this road or not alone because they walked in twos, but that is beside the point. But this man heading with his back to the temple, to where the sacrifices and the oblations and the things of God were all offered up, Jerusalem, the city of God, and he's heading down, and it was a downward road down into Jericho, which was the city of the curse. In Joshua's day, God cursed it, and the two men, he said not to build it, and the two people that built it, he, 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 he took them out. And this was the city known as the city of the curse. And so you are here tonight, and you're not saved, and you're a sinner, and you have your back towards God. There's no other way of explaining it. You have your back towards God and you're walking away from the things of God and every time you hear the gospel and every time you're presented with the message and every time you hear the text and every time the Holy Spirit speaks, you walk on. Well, let me tell you that you're on a dangerous road. You're on a dangerous road. And as this fellow walked on and walked down it, I tell you, it wasn't very long until the thieves wounded him. Now, wounding speaks of shame. Uh, the, the, the wounding speaks of pain. And uh, he was paid. She, uh, stripping speaks of shame. They, they stripped him, that speaks of shame. And we know that through the scriptures. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in our place condemned he stood. So he shamed, first of all, as they stripped him. And then uh, the wounding speaks of pain. And my dear friend, there's dear sinners tonight, and they're in great pain, and they're in great shame, because they continue on on their own rebellious downward road. And half dead speaks of hopelessness. And I say to you tonight, as you go on away from God, those here, if they're so, and those listening to me tonight, turn while the Saviour in mercy is calling and steer for the harbour light. For the further you go down, the worse the devil will get, and he'll destroy you at the very end. And here we have this picture of this man walking away from God, walking away from the things of God, from the house of God, doing his own thing and going right down into the city of the curse. The city with the judgment on it. And that's where men and women are heading without Christ. And I trust tonight that you'll turn around and that you'll come back. Now I want to handle this narrative tonight in a way maybe you've never heard it handled before. Uh, I've only preached on this maybe once in all my 
in, in all my preaching of 35 years that I can remember. But I'm preaching on it completely different tonight for I have no notes from previous message. I want to handle it in a different way tonight by dwelling on the three, peeps, three types of people that come into contact with this man, leaving out one of them. The first that came in contact with this man was the bandits, was the thieves and the robbers. Now here's what they were saying to him. Listen. Here's what they were saying to him. This is their attitude. What yours, what's yours is mine and I want it and I'm going to have it. That's the attitude of the thief. That's the attitude of the robber. That's the attitude of the burglar tonight. What's yours is mine and I want it and I'm going to have it. That's their attitude. Now, before we rain condemnation down on these boys, is that old nature not in us all? And I want you to search your heart tonight. Because this old nature and this old sin is called covetousness. We might not use violence to get what we want. But we can use subtlety and craft and persuasion and sweet talk and backhanders. There's things that we want to have. There's things that we want to have. And there's no end. We will not go to have it. And it's not of God. Thou shalt not covet. Covetousness is a deep, hidden, deadly sin. Paul calls it the cloak of covetousness. It's covered up. Nobody can see it. It's a sin in there. But God knows our heart, and he knows our motives, and he knows what we're watching, and he knows what we're after, and he knows what we want. And what our old, old, materialistic mind think, thinks, I'd love to have that. It doesn't belong to you. And just leave it alone. Remember the day that David lay in his bed until evening time? When the kings went out to fight and battle? When his men were out at the dangerous places of the battle, the king the man in charge lay in bed until evening time, and he got up. And he intensely gazed upon Bathsheba washing herself. And at that moment, he might as well have looked into the eyes of her husband Uriah, one of his greatest soldiers, and said, What's thine is mine, and I want her. And he got her. He got her, and he just breached another commandment. Thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery. And my friends, we know the result of this, of this lustful gaze upon this woman. He went on to murder her husband, the child born to the relationship died, and sin and iniquity visit his family all his days. Remember the mighty wealthy King Ahab? He owned most of Samaria. There was a wee bit of ground, a garden, a vineyard belonging to Naboth, a godly man, and that was all that he owned, a humble, godly man. And old Ahab came to him one day and he says, What's thine is mine, and I want it. And he got it. But very soon after, the dogs licked, the, licked up his blood where he was destroyed. Oh, my dear friend, listen. We need to watch where we look 
need to watch where we look. And old Ahab went home, and he went to bed, and he began to cry like a child. And his wife Jezebel came, and she said, I'll get it for you. Oh, I tell you, my friend, and he whimpered and cried to her until old Jezebel set up godly neighbor, godly neighbors, told lies on him, and got him stoned to death. Remember, God remembers that which is past. Remember the prodigal when he came to his father and he said to the father, what is thine is mine and I want it and I want it now. And he got it and away he went to the, very, to the very gates of hell. Give me, give me, that's the generation we live in tonight. Give me, the give me generation. Judas Iscariot says, what will you give me? What will you give me? Instead of asking what we can get, what can we give? Our thinking needs to be turned around. Thirty pieces of silver Judas Iscariot betrayed the Son of God for. What are you betraying him for tonight? A glass of wine, a puff of a cigarette, a leak at pornography. What are you betraying him for tonight? Come up and let God know and repent of it. Number one. Number one. That had interaction with this man was the bandits and the robbers who says, what's thine is mine, and I want it now. Number two that had interaction with this man was the Levite. As I said, the other boy passed on the other side. We'll let him go on, for he's going to hell anyway. With all his robes and phylacteries and garments, he's on his way to hell. He had no compassion for the lost. And I'll tell you, there's hundreds walked out of churches and cathedrals and places today, and they're on their way to hell. They're having a bit of compassion for the lost. They're having the word saved or born again about them. Let them go on. Let this other boy go with him. Because he's maybe as worse, if not as bad, if it's not worse. He stopped and looked, and here's what he said. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. I'm not giving it to you. I'm not giving you any help. Goodbye. I saw you in, this, I saw you in the temple this morning. Goodbye. Nothing to offer. Nothing to offer. I trust that I'm not speaking to somebody here tonight or somebody listening to me tonight that's sitting under some old dead minister and they've nothing to help you with. They have no salvation for your soul. Come out from among them. And be clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Don't be found in there when the Lord comes back. No. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. I don't care whether you go to hell or not. I'm not doing anything. I'm not giving you anything. Oh, what an attitude. Is that our attitude tonight? Well, you know, in a sense it is in many ways. And as this boy gathered up his pious robes and his phylacteries and headed away, leaving the poor man stripped and wounded and dying, God help him. Tell me this. Let me ask this question. If this, if this boy got better, didn't he? Do you think he did anything to do with these boys after that? Hmm? 
Do you think that he would have had anything to do with them? He wouldn't have been that big a fool. He's lying there. He's half dead. He's wounded. He's attacked. he's, he's, He's dying. And all this man can say to him, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. I'm not going to do anything for you. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to do a thing for you. And that is our attitude in so many ways. It's old nature, grounded into us, rubbed into us like the Vic. Oh, don't touch that, it's mine. It's mine. And I'm going to keep it. That's my car. That's my home. I was climbing a gate a couple of years ago and this farmer shouted at me, that's my gate. That's a good gate. Don't be climbing the gate. It's mine. Remember this, believer tonight. What you have is not yours. You're bought with a price. Not even do you own yourself to say to God, I'll do this or do that or do the other. No, no. You're bought with a price and you belong to him and you're supposed to be going at his commandments and in his will. Remember the rich farmer? Remember him? This is mine. The fields, the flock, the, 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 the fruit, and even the future. He says, all's mine, for I'm going to build barns, and I'm going to do great things, and I'm going to do mighty things. Boy, what a fool. God said, thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Illustration after illustration flows from this book regarding what I'm saying tonight. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. I'm not going to go to the mission field. I'm not going to sell my house. I'm not going to go out to give tracts. I'm not coming on Saturday to the prayer meeting on the day of fasting. I'm not. Saturday's a family day. Saturday's the day that I go shopping. Well, you're not concerned too much about your children. Saturday's my day. Hmm? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give that. I can't give that. I'm not going to tie that amount of money. It's not yours. It's mine, not yours. You have nothing tonight. We have nothing tonight. Not one thing. God says and God says, says in Daniel, God in whose hand our breath is. Our breath. David says, There's but a step between me and death, but a step and but a breath. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Sapphira, they sold the possession, Acts chapter 5. And they said that they give it all, but they hid part of it. And then they came and here's an awful, here's an awful statement in the Word of God. They lied to the Holy Ghost. Oh, God help us. Please, there's one thing I wouldn't want to be guilty of, and that's lying to the Holy Ghost. Oh, I said, we, we, we give it. We give all. No, they did not give all. And God faced them that night, and both of them ended up in their graves. The tithe is not yours. The time is not yours. The talents are not yours. 
and the need to be utilized for God. What a way to leave this man. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it, and keep it he did, and on he went. Thank God it doesn't end there. Thank God comes the good Samaritan on a beast and it says that he had compassion on him. These other boys had one ounce of compassion. I wonder what compassion we have tonight. Have we any compassion for those folk at the Red Ford? Have we any compassion for our neighbours? And here the good Samaritan comes, and here's what he said. What's mine is thine, and I'll give it all to you now. Blessed Savior. Blessed Savior. What a difference in me and you. And jumping down, he takes the oil and he soothes the wound, and the wine, he disinfected the wound. And on the other hand, the oil speaks of the blood, and the wine speaks of the Holy Spirit. Oh, what teaching. What blessed messages are in this. You see, this man and his donkey was a sort of an ambulance of the day. He was traveling around maybe this road with oil and wine. But our Lord Jesus Christ, he went about doing good, didn't he? Of course, he's a picture of our Savior. And they have to go outside their own people to get a picture of the Savior. Hmm? They have to go away from the temple and away from the Jews and away from all those with all the religious activity, away from all those that were singing and praying and shaking hands and all the rest. They had to go away out of that to get a picture of Christ. And just you and I close this meeting tonight, I think. I'll tell you, this man had no fear in him. My Savior had no fear either. He was no weakling. Glory to his lovely name tonight. He was no weakling. He came. And he poured in the oil and he poured in the wine. He got off the beast and he put him on it. He took his place. And that old cursed road that Jerome called it the bloody way. The bloody way. At least once a week there was somebody murdered on it. And he got off and he stood on that old cursed road and gave the man his place on the beast. I tell you, he came, it says, to where he was. Now I tell you, he came to where we were. He came from the ivory palaces on high to this old sinful world. And he took my place and died for me. Blessed Savior. Do you hear that tonight, sinner? He died for you. Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me when all the rest of them ran on? I tell you, they all abandoned me in Fermanagh. Christians too. And I thank God the Savior didn't abandon me. I thank God he stepped in and came to where I was, weary and worn and sad, 
and I found in him a resting place, and he hath made me glad. Set him up on the beast, poured in the oil and the wine, The oil poured speaks of the blood that cleanseth us. The wine poured speaks of the Holy Spirit that enters us. And once we are cleansed from our sin, the Holy Ghost will come in. If we confess our sins tonight, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the Holy Spirit will come in and dwell within you. And then he took him to the inn. And the inn, in my opinion, speaks of the church. He put him into fellowship. He put him into a place where he would be nurtured and looked after and cared for until he came again. And we need to be in the fellowship of the church. We can't live isolated lives. We need to be part of the assembly. We need to be involved in it. We need to be in membership in it. He put him in there and he paid a price to the ones in the inn to look after him. And then he says, when I come back again, if I owe you more, I'll give it to you. Now inside the church of Jesus Christ are ministers and elders and pastors and speakers, and it's the responsibility of those in leadership of a church to look after the wayward sinners that are saved and brought in. And we don't do a good job at it. But I want to tell you this, my dear friend, elders and deacons and leaders in churches, there's going to be rewards for your work. When he comes again, when he comes again, He will reward for faithfulness. Faithfulness. So let every man examine his own heart. Let every member and associate member examine their own heart. Faithfulness to the work of God. His rewards will be with him. What's thine is mine. I want it and I want it now. What's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. What's mine is thine and I'll give it all to you now. And bless him. He poured out the oil and the wine. Bless him he gave himself for us. He knew what it was to be attacked. He knew what it was for vicious, evil, and wicked men and the bulls of Basham to hammer him. He knew what it was to be stripped. They stripped him naked. And when you see a picture of Christ on the cross with a covering of a garment over him, it's a lie. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Can you imagine the humiliation of being hung on a cross in the front of filthy-mouthed Roman soldiers? Did he do it for fun? He knew what it was to be shamed. He knew what it was to be wounded. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. 
wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. And for you tonight, he was wounded. He knew what it was to be abandoned. He knew what it was to be left alone. He knew what it was to be forsaken. He knew what it was for the priests and Levites and the Pharisees to mock him and laugh at him. And as always, my Savior went a little further, for he wasn't half dead that killed him. I killed him. You know, it wasn't the Samaritan that killed him. It was his own people. For if his own people would have been living according to the law that they were teaching for one whole month up in the temple and doing the things that the Word of God told them to do, they'd have rescued him. But at the hands, he was wounded in the house of his friends. Ah, but it doesn't end there. Glory to God, it doesn't end there. On the third day he rose again. And he lives tonight in the power of an endless life. And he's coming back again. He's coming back to pay. I'll tell you, he's coming back. He says, when I come again, Jesus is coming again. And he's coming to take these poor, wounded souls, these tripped souls, these souls, millions of them that the devil got on the Jericho Road and almost had destroyed them and almost had them into hell until he came and he lifted them from sinking sands. He rescued them and lifted them and brought them out of darkness into the marvelous light of the glorious gospel and sent them out into the world, so many of them, to preach the gospel. And those of you in this meeting tonight living in the joy of the Lord because one day you can say, He lifted me. <coughs> and someday he's coming back to take us out and to take us home and we shall be forever with the Lord let us pray Father we bow in thy presence we thank thee O oh God for the good smart. We thank thee for our Saviour, Lord. Thank thee for the blood that he shed, the pain that he suffered. And oh God, we just thank you for those of us who can say tonight that he lifted me. So Lord, I pray that you'll speak to hearts tonight even to the hearts of our thy people. Time is short. Our life will soon be over. And oh God, get our eyes focused on other things instead of the things of this world and the things of time. For Christ's sake, amen.